Okay, so uh, I'm talking today with Mike Vax of the Prescott Jazz Summit, and um, it's this week, and can you tell us the days, times, places, and how people can attend? Sure. Um, uh, it's, it's this entire weekend. It's always the weekend before Labor Day. That's ah. what we've always done. This is our 19th year, so we're happy to say we've been going a long time. And Friday night, we're at the Elks Opera House. And uh, there's a little bit of weirdness in that because the Elks has their own ticket thing yeah. with Vendini. So for Friday night, people can order their tickets. Uh, what is it? Uh, Elks Theater, PrescottElksTheater.com. Right. And um, people can order their tickets or they can get them at the door. Mm -hmm. Friday night at the Elks. Uh, also, they can get transferred right there. Our website is prescottjazzsummit.net. Ah. Prescottjazzsummit.net. And if you want to just order everything there, you can be transferred over to the Elks, but you would pick your tickets up for Friday night at the Elks. Okay. And then, uh, uh, so that's Friday night, and the concert starts at 7 o'clock. We're labeling it this year a celebration of jazz from New Orleans to New York. Cool. So we're going to be doing all kinds of different things from the history of jazz. Uh, the first set will start out with my Great American Jazz Band and we'll be doing a whole bunch of New Orleans tunes, which everybody loves. Mm -hmm. And nothing will be far out, but we'll get through swing, we'll get into early bebop, and uh, it'll be uh, uh, you know, quite, a, quite an array of tunes, a lot mm -hmm. of different styles. Mm -hmm. um, then Saturday, we're at Ruth Street Theater at Prescott High School, and that's all day. So from 10 in the morning until 2 in the afternoon, we actually have the educational part. And at 10 o'clock, Bradshaw Mountain High School Jazz Band's gonna play, and then our guys will go up on stage and work with them and show them how to get better. Then at 11 o'clock, Prescott High School Jazz Band will play, and our guys will go up on stage with them. 12 o'clock, we'll break into different rooms, and so trumpets will be in one room, and trombones in another, saxes, rhythm, and, um, and also Ginger Burglar will be doing stuff for vocalists. Uh, and then at 1 o'clock, we're going to have a panel discussion on jazz history and jazz improvisation. Oh, wow. And so we're going to really get in with the musicians to talking about what they know about the history of jazz and, and how that history ties in with one of the most important parts of jazz music, which is improvisation. Right. So that will be from 10 until 2 in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. And it, that is completely free for everybody. Adults, students, if you want to come, completely free at Ruth Street Theater at Prescott High School. Then Saturday night, we always do our all-star big band. Mm -hmm. uh, and the band is always just killer. This year, of course, we have some Arizona musicians and a couple of other states, but we have quite a few guys from Los Angeles and Las Vegas coming. Uh, one of the new people will be Ronnie Rose, who has been voted the Entertainer of the Year a few times in Las Vegas. Wow. Amazing singer. The other one that's really big, and, and you know, for, for many, many years, Ken Byers was our, our yeah. MC, And of course, we lost Ken, sadly, to cancer. And I thought, what am I going to do? Who am I going to get that would be as enthusiastic as Ken Byers? Well, I have an old friend that I used to tour with who happens to be the comedian that was on Johnny Carson's old tonight show more than any other comedian and that's Pete Barbuti from Las Vegas ah, yes. who is just one of the funniest people on the face of the earth and also a great musician so Pete will be the MC for the entire weekend <laughs> so this is going to be amazing mm -hmm. so that's Saturday then Sunday all new this year we always do a jazz brunch and we always do an all-star jam session um, both of them this year are going to be on the third floor at the top of the Elks Theater in the new performing arts area. Mm -hmm. And it's a very beautiful place. It's like a small ballroom. Uh, it will be catered by Barry Barbie with Elgato Azul, mm -hmm. so the food is going to be tremendous. The jazz brunch goes from 10 in the morning until 2 in the afternoon. All the musicians from the festival will be playing. And I, I put them together in different groups. Mm. And so we, just, we plan it that way. So you'll have great music and great food. 
that's from 10 until 2 on Sunday. Then there's a break in the afternoon. We like for our out-of-town people to go down to the square and shop. <laughs> so we tell them, you know, you got a break. You're mm -hmm. right close. Go down to the square and visit, visit the square. Mm -hmm. So then at 5 o'clock, we'll have the All-Star Jam session, also again up at the top of the Elks, also catered by El Gato Azul. Mm -hmm. So that uh, uh, Sunday's going to be a very interesting day. As I say, we've usually done a different, we've done many different places. We've done La Ciampa, we've done St. Michael's, we've done Prescott Lakes Country Club. Uh, I'm trying to think of a couple other places where we've had the brunch. Uh, so, <clears throat> but this is our first time mm -hmm. being up at the top of the Elks. And of course, rather than being in a restaurant, this way it's catered. And of course, they have, uh, they have a kitchen up there and everything, so it works out great for Barry. And then we've done the jam session quite a few times at Murphy's, which has always worked out great. But Barry, being a co-sponsor of the festival, asked if we could try doing it up there, and he would and he would cater that. So that's what we're doing. So Sunday's easy because you just go to the same place twice, <laughs> you know. And um, so that's pretty much the schedule of the weekend. Uh, uh, it, it's it's interesting that people say well. Okay, so how many musicians? I think this year we have 26 different musicians. Wow. Um, and Friday night and Sunday, they'll be in different conglomerations mm -hmm. for different sets. Mm -hmm. So you get to hear, maybe there's a couple of sax players you like, or trumpet player, trombone player. You maybe hear them with one thing, with one rhythm section. Mm -hmm. And then later on, you'll hear them with a couple of other different musicians with a different rhythm section. Mm -hmm. So it, it really gives a varied program, and you never know. I mean, the whole thing, you know, jazz music, like I say, one of the most important things in jazz music is improvisation. And for me, one of the most important things and one of the most fun things of our festival is the camaraderie of the musicians. A lot of these musicians don't see each other all the time because they live, you know, hundreds or thousands mm -hmm. of miles apart and there a lot of them are good friends. So we come together, it's like a family, you know, reunion right. coming together. And so we apologize for the technical difficulty and we're going to continue now. Um, you said there was a cutoff date for buying tickets oh, yeah, on the, Sunday. The only cutoff is for Sunday. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, we're cutting the, the sales of Sunday tickets off at 5 o'clock tomorrow on Thursday, basically because Barry has to order food right. on Friday. So, uh, so Sunday, tickets, uh, Sunday tickets will be on sale until 5 o'clock tomorrow. Uh, you won't be able to buy them at the door. Okay. Uh, maybe if a couple people snuck, we could probably get them in, but <laughs> I, I didn't say that. But, but, but Friday and Saturday, mm -hmm. the tickets are on sale right up until up until uh, showtime. showtime and they're available at the door both at the elks and at ruth street theater um, today and then tomorrow during the day and earlier on saturday the chamber of commerce is one of our ticket outlets so you can if people are downtown right here on goodman street they can go to the chamber and buy tickets Great. Um, tickets for sunday uh, if you get them today or tomorrow there's also tickets at, at el gato azul at the restaurant, mm -hmm. uh, and on our website, which I'll repeat again, which is prescottjazzsummit.net, um, you can order any of the tickets. We have only online a special discount where if somebody wants to get everything for Saturday and Sunday mm -hmm. or an all-day Sunday, we have discounts oh. that you can do online. Very nice. Uh, and then the phone number, the phone number is... 928-830-2462, 830-2462, and people can call. You can't actually order tickets, but you can get all the information, uh, any information you need on, on, uh, about what we're doing. Uh, and then most of the people, I'd say 85% of all the tickets sold are online. Okay, you know? good. Um, so, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, your career, how did you end up in Prescott? Oh, wow, okay. Well, my career has been a long one. <laughs> uh, I started playing in the third grade in elementary school. Wow. And uh, uh, 
it was interesting because, you know, they just have the song flutes, they call them recorders now. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mrs. Aldridge, we had, an, back when California actually had good music programs in the schools, there was a hundred piece orchestra in my elementary school. Wow. And usually you, if you did well with the song flutes in third grade, you'd go in in the fourth grade. Well, Mrs. Aldridge gave us the stuff. I got so turned on with this. And I don't consider my, myself a prodigy at all, but I got so turned on. I'm working on this. So after about five or six weeks, I go to Mrs. Aldridge and I say, what do you want me to do now? And she said, I want you to do next week's lesson. And I said, no, you don't understand. I know the whole book. <laughs> so I played the stuff in the back of the book for her. And she said, well, OK, I'm putting you in the orchestra in the high third grade. We didn't have enough money to buy an instrument back then. And, and uh, the school's instruments were mostly gone. So there was this one beat up cornet that she had left. So she handed it to me and said, this is what you're playing. So it found me. <laughs> and uh, uh, all the way through elementary, through junior high, through high school, I was just you know, immersed in music. Uh, and then when I was a little before my 17th birthday, I joined the Musicians Union. So I was playing union jobs while I was still in high school. And uh, this was in the Bay Area in California. Right. And uh, then went on to University of the Pacific, the conservatory, a uh, very classical conservatory. But uh, I went on and got a degree in music performance. Immediately uh, after that, I got drafted. And my teacher, who had been in the Navy band, had it arranged so that I could switch my draft from the Army to the Navy. So I went into the Navy music program, went into a band called the Navy Show Band. Uh, which was a really good band. And President Kennedy had started a goodwill thing with South America. And we toured South America half the year every year, uh, you know, for, mm -hmm. for the State Department, not for the Navy. So I did that for four years. And then Stan Kenton, one of his people, heard me play. And uh, it long involved story, but make it short. Stan Kenton actually got me out of the Navy four months early to join his band. Oh, wow. He pulled some strings in Washington, <laughs> D.C. So then I joined Stan Kenton's band. Uh, after that, uh, I played with the Glenn Miller band a little bit. I played with Jimmy Dorsey band a little bit. I played with Harry James band a little bit. Uh, I led the Dukes of Dixieland in New Orleans. Wow. Lived there for a while. Uh, and all the time with this, I've also been doing workshops in high schools and colleges. I love teaching, but I never just wanted to teach in one school. Right. So I've been doing clinics in schools for, for 50 years, or more than 50 years. I've also taught at some major universities, University of New Orleans, Loyola University in New Orleans, University of the Pacific. Uh, uh, so I've done some uh, university teaching also. Mm -hmm. um, and. It was interesting that I was playing a jazz festival up in the San Juan Islands outside of Seattle. And there's a lady that's uh, in her 90s. She's still alive. She lives in Prescott, Tig Pennock. Big fan of my Dixieland band. And we're having dinner one night. And, and I was joking. I say, yeah, Peggy and I don't want to stay in California when she retires from teaching. And I made a joke, we'd love to live, go to Sun Valley, Idaho, because there's a nice festival there. And I said, but you've got to be Arnold Schwarzenegger or Bruce Willis to be able to afford to live there. And she said, well, have you ever been to Prescott, where I live? And I said, in all my years on the road, I've never been to Prescott. So we came here and visit her, visited her and immediately decided this is where we wanted to be. Mm -hmm. So we immediately bought land and then sold the land and got the house that we're in. And um, so we've had a home here, for condo and then a house. We've had a home here for 20 years, but we've been uh, here full time since 2010, mm -hmm. since my wife retired from. She was a music teacher, a middle oh, school wow. music director, mm -hmm. and uh, and we love living here. So that's how I came to Prescott. Was basically mm -hmm. I was teaching at a summer camp, music camp here, mm -hmm. and started looking around and said, Yeah, this is this is a good place. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, can you tell us a little bit about the backstory of the Jazz Summit itself? Sure. There used to be a gentleman in Prescott, everybody loved him. He was sort of Mr. Music in Prescott, Claire, Claire Willie. Mm -hmm. And Claire did some teaching, Claire owned a music store for a while, Claire had a big band, had a small group, everybody knew Claire. And when I started coming here, and he knew that I, was, I produced jazz festivals, and he said, you got to help me because I've always wanted to do a jazz festival here. I said, yeah, this is a great place. 
So we put, we put it on, and the first year it was called Jazz in the Pines. And um, uh, after that first year, he had a brain aneurysm and passed away very yeah. suddenly. He was only 70 years old. And I thought, well, there's the end of that festival because I can, I can put together a festival, but all the contacts were his. And I had this premonition one day, and it said, if you don't keep that festival going, Claire is going to haunt you the rest of your life. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, that one year, I guess it would have been 2001, uh, I canceled. We started doing it in October, and I canceled all my gigs in October and came here during the summer and came here in October, and we put it on. One, that was one day back then. Put it on again. It was successful. And then the third year, we started with a three-day festival, and it's been going three-day festival ever since. Wow. So um, it's 19 years old this year. This is the program that will be handed out. Can you tell me a little bit about the, art, the artists who designed the front of the program? Well, the artwork is from Leo Meyersdorf. Mm -hmm. And Leo actually started that whole school of art in mm -hmm. New Orleans. A lot of people followed him. Leo and I were drinking buddies in New mm -hmm. Orleans, and, and he was also a good piano player and trombone player, and just an immersed in jazz music. He lived in New York for a long time and knew all the most famous musicians. He did uh, uh, album covers for Dizzy Gillespie, for Thad Jones, Mel Lewis, Big Band, for all these bands in New York, and then moved to New Orleans, and uh, uh, that's where we became acquainted and we were very good friends. Then when he, he left New Orleans before I did, they had a ranch up in Oregon and we used to go visit him. I used to go visit him there with my family. And uh, so we stayed in touch all this mm -hmm. time. And I started thinking I would love to have some of his artwork for our festival and, uh, and talk to his widow because there's a whole estate that controls right. everything. And sad to say, there have been some festivals that have sort of stolen his artwork off the internet, which I am not a fan of at all. And so I talked to Jennifer and said, well, we want to pay a fee. We want to do this properly. And so, of course, you can see that his name and his website right, are there. there. And, uh, and we got permission to use this artwork for this year. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, you've mentioned a couple of times about um, doing classes in colleges and high schools. Can you talk a little bit more about um, why you decided to start teaching uh, in high schools? Well, I've always loved teaching. Mm -hmm. I just didn't want the confines of teaching in a school and then having to deal with administrations. <laughs> you know, administrations and education yes. sometimes. Anyway, so uh, with Stan Kenton's band, when I was on his band, he was really one of the fathers of jazz education, mm -hmm. and he was the first band leader to really bring his band into schools and work with kids. So when, when I was doing that with his band, I thought, boy, I love doing this. So after I got off the band, I started doing it on my own, really full time, and, uh, and just decided that if we're going to keep this music alive, we have to get it to the young people. And so when this festival started here, that was one of the most important things to me, was that we continue that, that education, when we call it educational outreach. And uh, one of the things that we've done, we have presented music in every school in the Prescott School District, plus Prescott Valley, plus Chino Valley, plus some other outlying areas up in Sedona and stuff. And the way we do it is, we pay the musicians. I, I refuse to ask musicians to play for free. Right. Too many people do that, you know. Mm -hmm. We have to make a living too. We raise the money through donations, if anybody's interested, and um, uh, we pay the musicians. It's always completely free to the school. Mm -hmm. And so we'll go in and do an assembly and play and talk about jazz history and play music for the kids. And then after the assembly, we'll do a workshop for the music students. Mm -hmm. And we've done that over the years in all the schools. I just did a thing last week at Abaya Judd Elementary, mm -hmm. just myself, and I did a history of jazz. And mm -hmm. then I, I got the kids to sing and I played, you know, and then one of the things that I'll do with them is like I got them to sing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, mm 
<laughs> and then I got them to sing and I improvised over it. Mm -hmm. You know, and so uh, I just think that that educational thing is so important and it's one of the biggest things, our educational outreach for the festival. Right, right. Um, so basically, um, when you talk about jazz, a lot of people think immediately New Orleans jazz. And jazz improvisation, I've heard uh, from time to time, I can't make much sense out of it, but I don't really understand the genre of jazz. How do you think, if people want to educate themselves before coming to hear uh, your um, different concerts and such, where do you suggest they begin? Well, it's always good to begin with New Orleans jazz. New Orleans jazz is, uh, traditional jazz is very accessible. First of all, the early jazz musicians were very untrained musicians. Mm -hmm. A lot of them never even gone to high school, much less studied music. They did everything by ear. Right. They learned everything. They learned the tunes by ear. So improvisation in the early days was basically just changing the melody around a little bit. Mm -hmm. And the guy that really was the first to change that around was Louis Armstrong. What he did was he started knowing more about the harmony and basing his solos on the harmony that the piano player was playing rather than just thinking about the melody. And so then improvisation became uh, more, maybe a little more complicated, you know, but it, it, it still stayed very accessible. Mm -hmm. um, and then Right after that, big bands were getting started. Well, you can't have 15 musicians sitting there improvising. So what happens? You have to write arrangements. Mm -hmm. So even in the 20s, Duke Ellington, the Castle Loma Orchestra, uh, so many others started writing arrangements and it became what we now know as the big band with five saxophones, four trumpets, four trombones, rhythm section. And the arrangements became more important than the improvisation right. in the big band era. Right. So there was a little bit of improvisation, mm -hmm. but the arrangements were really what was important. And you have to remember that in the early days and through the big band era, all the music was played for dancing. Right. It was jazz music, but it was mainly played for dancing. Well, what happened in the late 30s and early 40s, some of these musicians who were really creative, uh, uh, Charlie Parker, Dizzy Gillespie, Thelonious Monk, Kenny Clark, a bunch of people that were working in New York, a lot of them were working on Cab Calloway's band, and there was a place called Minton's Playhouse up in Harlem. They would go after their big band job to mm -hmm. Minton's Playhouse and have jam sessions. Wow. And they would then, everything was improvisation. Mm -hmm. And they would just make up tunes, make up based on chord changes, but make up tunes, all improvise all night. And that music started becoming more for listening than dancing. Mm -hmm. um, so that then what happened was some of the big bands, my old boss, Stan Kenton, was one of the first who decided, I want my band playing concert halls concert kinds of music, almost like a symphony orchestra, right. rather than playing for dancing. I want people sitting and listening to the music. Mm -hmm. So the music did become more complicated. And uh, Stan Kenton was always way, way ahead of his time. Some of his stuff wasn't as accessible. And then some of the bebop players got a little too far out, and they basically started playing for themselves instead of the audience. Right. You can't do that. Mm -hmm. if you want an audience. Right. So then that got turned around to where even though they were playing bebop, there were a lot of the players who really, like Clark Terry, one of my old bosses, was one of the main ones, we're going to play this jazz music, but we're going to still entertain the people. Right. And so that came back around. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so a lot of times people think, well, oh, it's going to be this far out stuff. Most jazz is not far out. No. It, it, certain elements and certain bands can get far out, mm -hmm. but most everything that we play at the at the jazz summit it's very accessible. And one of the great things about improvisation with regard to jazz music, once you've stated the melody, 
and then there's the room for solos, for improvisation, you're never going to play the same thing twice. Right. What I play tonight won't be what I'll play tomorrow night. Mm -hmm. And that kind of musical freedom, jazz is one of the only places that there is. Most music, you have to play what's written on the page for right. an orchestra. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it, a pop, a pop group has to recreate what they did on the record every time they play. Right. They don't have the, the yeah. wherewithal or the fun or the flexibility to say, okay, tonight I'll do something different. Mm -hmm. And so I think that what people have to realize is what they're going to hear at the Jazz Summit is very accessible. Mm -hmm. They're not going to be able to sit still. They're going to want to tap their toes and stuff. Uh, I always tell them if somebody really needs to dance, dance in the aisle or dance wherever, sure, whatever. I mean, you know. <laughs> you know. And um, while we don't have venues where we, well, actually on Sunday there will be some dance floor. Mm -hmm. There will be a dance floor. Uh, but but I think the main thing for people who don't know jazz yet, listen to Louis Armstrong. Yeah, that's the father. That's where we all came from. Mm -hmm. Even even the farthest out people like Miles Davis or John Coltrane or any of those people, everybody says the same thing. We came from Louis Armstrong. Mm -hmm. So. If you want to find out, and he was a great singer besides being a great trumpet player, mm -hmm. great entertainer, and so start there. And mm -hmm. then online, it's great because you know we have the internet now. You can go and start looking up the history of jazz music, mm -hmm. and look up what happened in the big band era. And you know, I tell the kids if you take some of the most popular people that you know in pop music today. Mm -hmm they would not be as famous as Glenn Miller was in 1939. Right. He was the most famous musician in the world. Mm -hmm. That band, and of course, that music was technically based on jazz. It was called swing music. It was made for dancing. But the Glenn Miller Orchestra was the most famous band in the world. Mm -hmm. You know, and so all of those bands, you go back to the 40s with Glenn Miller and Tommy Dorsey and Jimmy Dorsey and Harry James, and on and on and on, uh, Count Basie, Duke Ellington, Stan Kenton, Woody Herman, Buddy Rich, all these bands, uh, uh, very accessible and fun music. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, wrapping up, let's uh, have you go over um, the events and where you can get the tickets from. Sure, okay. Again, Friday night is at the Elks Theater. Right. Uh, the show starts at 7 o'clock. I think the doors will be open probably 6. Um, Saturday in the daytime from 10 in the morning till 2 in the afternoon at Ruth Street Theater at Prescott High School, mm -hmm. which of course is on Ruth Street. Right. Uh, uh, free open workshops and clinics. A couple of the high school bands will be playing. It's fun to hear them play. The musicians will be talking about jazz history and all kinds of stuff. Then Saturday night, 7.30 concert. Uh, it will be opened by Prescott High School Jazz Ensemble. And then our all-star big band will play. And it'll be music of the great big bands. There'll be all kinds of wonderful things going on. Uh, Sunday morning and then the early evening. So the jazz brunch is from 10 in the morning till 2 in the afternoon. Uh, the uh, All-Star Jam Session, also with food, both of them sponsored by Elgato Azul, um, catered by Elgato Azul. Uh, that one is 5 to 7.30. Uh, tickets uh, for Friday night and Saturday night are from 18 to $30. Okay. Spread, there's discounts for seniors and for students, but between 18 and $30. The Jazz Brunch is $55. Mm -hmm. Believe me, it'll be worth it. There'll be great food and lots of great music. The All-Star Jam Session Sunday evening is $35. Mm -hmm. um, and again, Elgato will be catering both of those. Um, tickets are online at prescottjazzsummit.net or prescottelkstheater.com for Friday night. Right. Uh, but you can go to ours to prescottjazzsummit.net and also be transferred to the Elks. So what will happen is people going to the Elks will pick up their tickets at the Elks. Then the, P, the tickets for Saturday and Sunday 
will have a will call table at every event. Cool. And they can pick, the people who have ordered online will pick up their will call tickets. Mm -hmm. uh, Friday night, Saturday night, tickets available at the door. Mm -hmm. They're not more expensive if you buy them at the door. Okay. So if you haven't been able to make up your mind and you finally think Friday or Saturday night, I want to go out and hear some music. Just come to the door and you can get your tickets. But Sunday... Sunday, because Barry has to order food, mm -hmm. yeah. Sunday sales will be cut off Thursday at 5 o'clock. Mm -hmm. So if you want to come to the brunch, it's going to be fantastic. You have to go online to Prescott uh, Jazz Summit .net, or you can get tickets at Elgato Azul. Uh, you can get tickets also at the Chamber of Commerce. Right. On Goodwin. Okay. Thank you very much for coming. Oh, it's my to pleasure. Talk to Thank us. you for having me come here. And this is Anita Cohen signing off.